Hello, my name is Agatha and I am the Business Advisory Manager at Business Station. Thank you for attending our Mike O'Hagan webinar series. Today's topic is about staying ahead of your competitors and change. We at Business Station are proud to bring you this session as part of the Digital Solutions Program, Australian Small Business Advisory Services, funded by us industry. The team at Business Station have teamed up with Australia's Mr. Mini Movers, Mike O'Hagan, to bring you a series of four, and this is number three. Um, we will help you learn uh, about Mike's recipe for success and what not to do if you want to win at the game of business. Mike O'Hagan is a been there, still doing it kind of guy. With $200 and a huge, Mike grew a short distance furniture moving business into a professional managed business that turned over almost $30 million, employing about 500 people. Without further ado, all right, Mike, do take it away. Sorry about that. There we go. Well, thank you. Thanks very much for that. Um, I want to thank ASBAS for the opportunity to share and um, a, a huge big thanks to, to the attendees that are attending. Um, Look, we only learn from each other and that's what it's all about. We won't learn business from a book and we kind of learn a lot of what we do from our experiences and trying to outthink what's gonna happen in the future. And a little bit of that's what we're gonna talk about today. Um, today, I'm gonna to share about our reaction, my business reaction to a massive drop in turnover, uh, red ink, uh, light ink, and massive job losses that we suffered about 10 years ago with the so-called GFC. Um, and how we saved the remainder of the business and we used how we saved it to step ahead of the competition. So evolving change is completely normal. And on the subject to change, change in business, huge, fast, big changes are very, very normal and have been going on for a long time. You know, if you go back to 100 years ago, uh, 120 years ago, just about, um, the, the uh, Ford invented the motor car and in a 15 year period completely wiped out the horse and cart industry wiped it out completely and replaced it with the motor car industry. So we suddenly started building roads and had fuel stations and a whole new industry and a whole new industrial thing around. And that change was really fast. People were upset about it. They, um, they uh, called the governments up and asked for protection. All the same stuff that's sort of happening today. It's all, it's not unusual. It's nothing different, fast change. And the business people that could see the change and understand how to change to it, survived and those that sat there with their eyes open like stun mullet got wiped out in the change so that's what it's all about today uh, look i need to remind everybody that uh, i was the founder and owner of mini movers uh, i uh, i had mini movers for 35 years so i grew it grew it, grew it from um, uh, from nothing a couple hundred dollar investment to about 28 million dollar turnover and 500 odd staff um, 18 months ago, I exited Mini Movers. I, I no longer have anything to do with the company. I'm out of it. Um, look, it's a great company, uh, and, and and I, I do. They are sharing with me. Are we are talking to each other? They're doing very well. But I just want to stress that I'm no longer part of it. And today's story is going to be a little bit about Mini Movers. The first webinar, um, and there are recordings for all this, was how I started business. My first business. I was working 90 hours a week, seven days a week, having two days off a year and how, the, how stupid that was and how I got my mind around that to, to rethink why am I in business and how that's essential. And as a result, I started a business that then worked for me and supported me and what I wanted, which was a lifestyle. Um, it's really essential that you know why you're in business. I help a lot of people and they don't know. And I see a lot of people trapped in their business, working huge hours and hardly earning anything. And that's become their lifestyle. And I think that's all wrong. You've got the wrong formula. Um, so that first webinar was about that. The second webinar, I shared a lot of strategies around that I used to grow uh, mini movers. Um, I, uh, all my businesses comes to that. Uh, I, I'm into conceive, test, measure, duplicate. In other words, come up with lots of ideas, test them in an affordable way, measure the results, duplicate what works, don't do what doesn't work. Um, I avoid assumptions, uh, therefore I don't do budgets, I won't do forward budgets, and I hate structured forward business planning that assumes that you're going to get a certain market share or have a certain turnover. I think it's all wrong. I don't guess anything. I only deal with what I know. And I very carefully test it in an affordable way. And then I do it a lot because I know it's going to work. Um, 
the focus, I also shared in my second webinar, it's a big focus about getting clients to rave about us because that's the best salesperson people for your previous, for, uh, your best salespeople are your previous clients and how we started um, and maintain that, that marketing strategy. Just an aside, the next webinar is going to be all around people uh, next week and it's really going to hammer in how we actually got the people to behave themselves to impress the customers. I'm really going to talk a lot about that next week. Today, of course, is staying ahead of the competitors and change. And I want to start the story with um, that in 2007, 2008, uh, I'd had mini movers for 20 something years. I forget what it was. I'd grown quite tired of it. It was the same stuff over and over again. It was a phenomenally good cash cow. We had a huge profit. Uh, we had lovely growth every year, every single year for 20, I think 22, 25 years. We had growth every year, growth in profit and, and growth in, um, in turnover. We never had any hard times. It was just perfect. Um, the company was around about 28, just, just under $30 million, I think 28, $29 million around about that in turnover, mm, roughly 500 staff. It had spread across to several cities in Australia and it was on the growth heading towards being a hundred million dollar company. And a lot of the people that in the background that, that talked to me about business were all saying to me, Mike, that's a very different business than what you've got now. What you've got now is a, an entrepreneurial business. You're the business. It's all about you and the driving of it. You're going to have to let it go. You're going to have to move it into a new model to go on. So what I've done is I've corporatized the company. I, I, I brought in, um, I'd set up a, a board. I, I even appointed a, a board, a, a um, chairman of the board. I became a mere director, uh, admittedly with the, with the shares but I became a mere director and, and we went on and we hired external management from the outside to come in and run the company. Because um, in my mind, I was preparing it to being this much, much bigger company to continue the growth, uh, growth not only in Australia, but to take the brand out. And in, indeed, I was in the middle of talking with the USA at that stage about what we're gonna do there. And that was wonderful. Um, they came in, they took over. And Whilst I sat in the boardroom and tried to make noises about don't change the culture, and they said we were not going to change the culture, in hindsight, they dramatically changed the culture. Uh, prior to corporatization, we were a fun place, uh, probably very incorrect place in some ways. We used loyalty and customer focus to get results. We were just, we all were a big family and we had a lot of fun and a, and a lot of things. Um, the corporates took it over to rules and more legalistic approaches. At the time, I thought, well, this is how we need to be to evolve to the bigger company. I can understand that. I can see what the big companies do, all their structured processes and all their big push on HR and having everything all set out and, and a lot of rules that we never had before because we just use common sense. Um, and that happened to us. It seems to me that governments keep adding laws and rules and workplaces are now becoming more rule driven and they're becoming a bit more sterile, sterile and scared. And it's make, that's making a lot harder for our smaller businesses to get over that, that hump that's there at the moment. Um, what's missing uh, in all this push by the governments is that we want to really, we want, all want to come to a happy workplace. We want a happy workplace, happy workplace, people stay, they don't move and everybody's fine. Most of our staff, they were not interested in a career uh, or anything like that. They, all they wanted was a, a really steady, secure job and to be appreciated in that job. And that's what we were doing in the culture that we had built. Anyway, enough of my soapbox in that area. <laughs> I get a bit carried away when I get into what some of the changes that are happening from that end of town. So we're okay, 2007. Um, 2007, of course, was a major change in the world. Uh, uh, Steve Jobs came on the stage one day from Apple and he said, this has got this new thing called a smartphone an iPhone, and that change, together with cloud-based computing, launched the world into quite an enormous change. And that is a significant factor in what I'm about to share with you, as well as, of course, two or three years after that, the world, Australia, dropped into what we call the global financial crisis. It grew out of the USA. Uh, it was a major disruption to real estate. Obviously, Mini Movers was very real estate orientated. We were moving about a thousand house loads a week at that stage, roughly. And suddenly out of nowhere, just like this uh, virus thing that came through about 12 months ago, this massive change stopped. The market dropped 
radically. We were tracking the market at the time. We were getting call. We were getting numbers from the number of properties being stamped every week and uh, for change of title and all that sort of stuff. We were tracking all that very carefully in our marketing department, and we watched the graphs drop. And two things happened: the number of properties being bought and sold, and the number of rentals being churned both dropped at the same time in the order of about 60%. So it was a massive change that came through and threw uh, many movers into turmoil. The, the turnover dropped and the profit disappeared. Uh, we started borrowing money. Um, when I handed the company over in 2007, we were virtually debt free. We actually owned our headquarters, I owned my house, no mortgage. There's no mortgage, and we 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 were pretty set up. We owned a, some of our depots, um, and we owned a lot of the trucks outright. Um, um, but um, uh, the profit disappeared. We started borrowing, of course, because I had plenty of collateral out there I could borrow against. Um, uh, we cut staff big time. Uh, we went from 500 down to below 200. And this destroyed the morale. Um, Customers reacted to the different morale and the effort many movers have become quite a toxic situation. Um, but the big one was we had no profit. Um, we were not playing things late. Um, the bank was getting our P&Ls uh, every month uh, or our financial statements. Um, and that was part of why they borrowed the money to us. They just wanted the financial statements. As I said, we weren't behind with anything. We were up to date with our tax, uh, which they were watching very carefully. Uh, we were up to date with everything. We were struggling to make payroll some weeks, but we were, the bank cash was short in the bank, but we were just, we were just getting by, but we had no profit. We were going backwards. If we hadn't borrowed money, we wouldn't be here today. Um, um, and red ink and growing debt was our, our, our biggest issue. Um, for two, two or three years, I made, and look, guys, hindsight's really cool. You know so much in hindsight, but at the stage looking forward, you just don't know what you don't know. One of the big problems with this change, you don't know how permanent it is. You know, the GFC didn't look permanent. The virus doesn't look permanent. But I've got to tell you, the world after virus is going to be different than what it was before. And the world after the GFC was very, very different than what it was before. So, and you don't know. And it looked like it was just going to suddenly come back. It was suddenly going to pick up. And um, so I sat in the boardrooms and I listened to planning and I listened to all these things that uh, they were planning on doing, planning on doing, and, uh, and nothing really effectively happened. And then one day the bank rang me and said, that's it. Now you have to do something. Uh, you've got a problem. Uh, yes, you've got red ink. We know, no, you don't have bad debts, but we can see that you've got ink. You've been borrowing. Your debt's going up. You've still got losses and you're heading in the wrong direction. You need to do something. At the time, I was a bit offended by the bank, but in hindsight, I think it was the best thing they ever did for me. It really woke me up to, you know what? I have to do something. You know, this is bad. We're not dealing with it. We're just delaying the inevitable. We're just like a lot of the stuff on job start and all that stuff at the moment, this the job keeper stuff, it's just delaying. Sometimes it's delaying the inevitable. If you're heading, if you're heading towards problems now, you need to react now. Don't leave it too late. So short story was I stepped back into the management of the company. Um, I, um, I stepped back at least into strategically steering the company. Um, we moved most of the XP external managers that we'd brought in on. Obviously that model wasn't working for us. Uh, we went back to what we knew before. Um, I promoted some internal people into roles where they were running the company. That worked. Uh, the way I figured it, it was much, much easier for me to teach one of our own people how to be a manager than it is to teach a manager how to be us, how to be mini movers and the way we think and the way we do things. And that worked for me brilliantly. It really did. Uh, coming back into the the day-to-day -day running of the company or coming back in, not to say the day-to-day -day running of the company, but coming back into really the running of the company, I had three issues. I had no profit. All right. I had no profit, full stop. And I don't care who you are, you can love your staff, you can love a lot of things and love your clients, but if you've got no profit, you've got a bigger problem on your hands than, 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 than what you think. Um, there had been, at the time, a major change in consumer behaviour. Quickest way for me to do this, explain this to you. 2007, we spent $1.2 million in the Yellow Pages book. By the time we got to 2010, which is where we're talking about now, that wasn't working anymore. It simply had stopped. 
and consumers didn't rely on yellow pages anymore. They went to a whole lot of different sources. They just didn't go to online. They went everywhere. They scattered to, and, and sourced their services or when they wanted to buy things, they sourced everything from uh, in a different way. So there was a big change in consumer behavior. And of course, I had low morale in the company. We'd gone from a happy place to a panicky place. Um, you know, as I said before, most of the people just wanted a secure job and it wasn't secure anymore. Uh, it was it was scary. Uh, people were losing their jobs. And yes, we were running around with big smiles on our face saying how wonderful it is and it's good. But the reality was most of them could smell it. They knew that there was, there was a problem there. And the elephant in the room, the fourth issue probably was debt. Uh, uh, we, we owned our buildings. Um, and I've got to tell you that we'd carefully purchased the buildings, so we'd bought them for the right price. Um, so, and that's what ultimately saved us, being able to, to sell mainly the headquarters. We managed to sell the headquarters and abolish the headquarters as part of the change we did, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. And that gave us the funds to completely wipe the bank out. And this other change I'm about to talk to you now turned us back into debt and turned us around. And then we dealt with the, the fact that we needed to find a new way to market the company because of the change of consumer behavior as part of what we're doing. Now, at this stage, 2010, from about 2007 on, to, well, 2008 on to 2010, I, I had got involved or started using a thing called Odesk. It later on became a thing called Upwork. It's an online platform where you can hire people from all around the world. Um, really, really good people, really, really cheap people, terrible people, and extremely good people all mixed up together. I had a, um, a PA working for me full time. She was the person I talked to more than anybody. Her name was Kate. I was paying her $4 an hour, which I understand is a very good wage. She was Filipino. She'd been with me for two or three years. We'd gotten to know each other and all the day-to-day -day stuff she was handling in the background, booking appointments, doing all sorts of things. So she knew what was going on. She was privy to the meetings and, and everything else. She knew what was going on. And when I stepped back into the chair, I picked the phone up and, and talked to Kate and said, listen, I think I need to hire more people like you. Uh, I can see that your wages are a lot lower than Australia. You're actually a really brilliant worker. If I can hire brilliant workers in the Philippines on lower wages, I think I can do something to address this profit issue we've got. And she went off and she went and explored what we now know as the offshoring industry. She went around, she talked to companies that did outsourcing, which is running in other processes, you know, the VA companies that did VAs and, and companies that did all sorts of things. And she found a company that supplied office space supplied that illegal employ employment entity so you didn't have to, to register anything and it was kind of like it was like a we work it was like a, a serviced offices except they had a legal entity for employing people so the people were legally employed with all the right conditions and everything and they had people that you picked that were working for you and that sounded really cool to me because i'm really into developing teams and getting everybody to run one direction i think it's vital for any business you've got to pull everybody together into a team you can't have individual people all over the place. You can't have a contractor here, outsource a bit over here, have this bit over there and think it's all going to work together. It's not going to work together. It's really not. So I was really into having everybody together. Uh, we at that stage had a head office in, in Brisbane. Um, at its peak, it had 65 people in the head office um, supporting the whole mini movers operation, everything from marketing through to sales, through to accounting, through to operations, training, all of those functions were all together in the head office in Brisbane. And it functioned very well because everybody knew everybody, everybody shared everybody. And when something went wrong, it was shared in the lunchroom and everybody knew and we all went on and everything worked very well. It's called TACIT knowledge, T-A-C-I-T. If you want to study anything at the moment and you're trying to build a team and you want to build a business and it's going to, it's going to have the right people driving it, go and study TACIT knowledge, the internal sharing that smaller businesses need to be able to get to get going. Don't get too trapped into systems and processes at this point, not when you're small. Later on, you can do that. So the Philippines was very interesting to me. You know, average wage, about $3 an hour for university qualified people. They cost you a lot more than that, of course, because there's on costs, office costs and all the other stuff. But um, uh, so, you know, roughly $130 a week uh, for most skills, you'll get accountants, for instance, anything like that for that sort of money. 104 million people 
They'd been Spanish for a few hundred years. They, they'd turned them into devout Christians. It's significant because it's the only Asian country that is extremely Christian. Therefore, they have the same core values. They think the same way we do. And the holidays line up. <laughs> same, same holidays. Easter's Easter and Christmas is Christmas. Um, but they'd also been an American colony for 40, for 40 plus 40 years. They were an American colony. The Americans had put their education system in lock, stock and barrel. And they became very, very American compared to anything else in Asia. But unfortunately, the Americans made a bit of a mistake when they came in and colonized it. They kind of left the, the Spanish political system in place. And it's a bit of a chaotic system. It really doesn't work very well. And as a result of that, it sort of leads towards poverty and, and, and the other issues that they have. If you look through, through South America, Central America, you'll see that to this very day, you'll still see the Spanish influence in their political systems. And you can see that the country is struggling, often struggling economically because of the way they're structured. And that's what they're doing. It's the third largest English speaking country in the world. They, uh, Americans put their education system in, it's compulsory, there's a literacy rate of 97.4%, which is slightly higher than, I think fractionally higher than Australia. Uh, but the interesting thing is they made their, their education system compulsory in English. So yes, they all speak English. Um, they also speak their local dialect, which is why you get that accent, but it's a good accent. It's a sort of an American slash bit of a Spanish accent. It's quite a, quite a good accent. Um, so that was the, the resource. Um, the education, there's a massive oversupply of all the skills you need. Uh, huge, huge oops, right? So where we have massive shortages, like for instance, accountants want to pick on this, massive short supply of accountants in Australia, over in, uh, in the Philippines, there's a massive oversupply. Um, and nurses and all the other skills, um, engineers, everything's there, and computer geeks, marketing people, all the thing. So Kate introduces to this, this resource with this office structure. So I flew up and I sat down and did some interviews. I intended to hire three people. I ended up only hiring one uh, because the other two uh, didn't turn up when they we wanted them to. Um, uh, and that's an ongoing thing. That's a bit of a problem you have there with them. Once you get them started, and once they understand you and they get in and understand your company, they stay with you. They're really good. They're very loyal. But up until then, they can be a bit fly flighty and not, not turn up and be a little bit unreliable. But that's just the way it is. If once you understand how to handle it, it's really good. So I hired one. Her name was Rika. Uh, she's still around today. Um, she uh, hadn't been in the offshoring industry before. She came from a family company, a legal company, where she was the girl that ran everything and did everything. So, but in the office as such, she didn't do the law part of it, but she ran the office, sent the bills out, banked the money, paid the paid everybody and et cetera, et cetera. And that was her and her father wanted to own that business and he wanted to, he, he wanted to sell it or move on from it. And therefore she was gonna be out of a job. And so I hired her and she turned into a 12. She was brilliant. We, uh, we taught her, showed her something once. We just could get connected up with Skype and simply talked to her. We had um, one of our people in our office and headquarters in Brisbane sit down with her one-on-one -on -one and said, okay, what we're going to teach you today is how to do this, da-da-da-da-da. And she just picked it up and she did it and she did it brilliantly. Um, we flew her down to Australia after a few months and we worked out that that is really, really, really important to really get them on board, doing it our way. And over a short period of time, we fairly dramatically ramped up the Philippines operation. Um, uh, later on, and it was about uh, quite a bit later, I don't know, maybe 12 months, two years later, the bank squeezed us a lot more and we got forced to sell our head office. And due to that and a couple of other circumstances, we ended up um, closing the head office completely and moving everything that's in the back end of the company to the Philippines. Um, it dramatically turned the profit round and it did it in a very short period of time. We went from about a $1.4 million loss to heading off towards a million dollar profit in about a five month period. And that took the pressure off everything. Then we got back into the old mini movers and started hiring more people and being what we used to do and doing all the wonderful things we used to do. Um, we didn't take systems and processes up to the Philippines. I've got to be very clear about this. The front end of mini movers, the end where you see where the guys arrive to move you and everything else is extremely systemized. They have a lot of electronics and very, very systemized. We've been that way for a long, long time, well before the GFC. 
However, the back end, the administration end was not systemized at all. It relied on human beings that just knew what they were doing. And of course, we had an accounting section, uh, we had a payroll section, we had uh, marketing, we had um, uh, sales all, and, and, and all those things. All those were in the back, but they weren't systemized in the back end. When we moved them to the Philippines, what we did is we really focused on training the Filipinos. And well, first of all, you have to teach them what Australia is. They are already English speaking, but they're American. Our biggest enemy is American. Everything's got a Z on it, and they they do things like that. You have to really Australianize. We had to teach them what Australia is, how the cities work, how everything works. Then we had to teach them what mini movers was and what we do and our terminologies and the words we use. Then we have to teach them their role and what they did in their role and how that did. And that's when we cottoned on that what you do, you need to systemize all that, but you build the systems up there. You teach them how to do it. You teach your Filipino staff how to do it. Then you get your Filipinos to sit together and build the systems, right? Now, there's a book out there called Systemology at the moment. Um, if you want to know anything about systemizing, contact me and I'll, I'll send you off to David. Um, David Jennings and the thing called Systemology. It's a really good book. It's using your own people to build the systems. And systems are really simple. Most people make it too complicated, but you need to do that. And we did a lot in the Philippines. And that was a huge mark of our success that we managed to build the systems and the processes up there. As time went on, we moved voice up. We took the voice sales up. Um, we experimented, we made a lot of mistakes. We corrected the mistakes, we perfected them. And as I said, profit came back. In hindsight, we treated the Philippines crew exactly the same as we would treat we treat the Australians. No different, exactly the same. In fact, we integrated all through the company. We sent Australians up there permanently, um, uh, and, and they lived up there. And, and we built that into the team. And we developed, we duplicated what we had there up there. We managed to duplicate it with about half the number of staff. The productivity is that much higher if you if you're doing it right. Um, I know that a lot of people claim the productivity is not up, but they're usually using home-based contractors, like what you find in Upwork and Odesk. That's a really hard model when you get past one or two staff members. It's a trap. If you get one or two staff members, you get stuck into it. That really is a hard model. You don't get the productivity. You're serious, don't. And you have staff turnover issues. We, we, we cured all that. We, we deal with it all by building this team. Um, they're the same. They're no different. They are the same, they're more family orientated than we are. Yeah, I've got that, but fundamentally they're exactly the same. You get good ones, you get bad ones. You hire somebody you think is fantastic and within a few weeks you find out they're nothing like what you thought they were. All that stuff's the same, no different. And you'll find a brilliant one and they'll love you and you love them and they'll stay with you forever. All that stuff's the same. They they learn fast, they learn a lot faster. Um, and um, as I said, you're teaching them is a little bit differently, but same, same, same. All the stuff we did, the incentive stuff, the motivational stuff, um, um, footy, footy tips, you name it, all that stuff, we did exactly the same. We built a team. We had them working together. They all, they walked into that office in, 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 in uh, the Philippines today. It's mini movers. There's mini movers everywhere. They think mini movers. They, they breathe mini movers. They are mini movers while they're at work. That's what it's all about. Listen, outsourcing is when you get a third party to run a set process for you. The most common outsourcing that virtually every business does is they outsource their accountancy work to an accountant. That's when you give the raw data to another service. They do whatever they do with it and give you back the results. That's outsourcing. That does not work for smaller businesses in other countries. It was the big thing and how the industry grew when corporates outsourced years ago. But with small businesses, outsourcing doesn't work. In industries, it only half works. Engineering and accountancy uh, have a lot of outsourcing services. That really, 20 years ago, that failed. It really didn't work very well at all. So getting other somebody else to run processes is not what I'm talking about. I'm also not talking about VAs. VAs was really 10 years ago. Small businesses and a lot of people running around talking about VAs. VAs was 10, it was really 10 years ago. It's not about VAs anymore. It's, it's about building a team. It's about having your people as a team in office space that's their office space or your office space, picked by you, onboarded by you into your organisation to do it your way, to your standards, all encouraged to work together and share for wherever you want to take your business. 
That's what makes your business grow. That's what's working for us in the Philippines. The other stuff's not working at all. Engineers, civil construction, electrical, even costing, everything. Drafting, architecture, marketing, all aspects of marketing. You can talk to me. If you want content writers, you must talk to me. There's a big trick to how you get content writers, but it can be done if you do it right. Uh, video, medical, accountants, anything to do with accountants, finances, all that stuff is, is readily available um, and with Australian experience too now because the industry has been going so long it's a lot of Australian experience floating around. Sales, voice and online, live chat, all that stuff. Lead gen, uh, we built an amazing lead gen system in the Philippines for mini movers. Uh, we transitioned that 1.2 million spend in yellow pages to an operation that costs, I think them costs about 120,000 a year. And it's actually a lead gen system generating leads for what they do now. So that was one and we picked up a lot. A lot of the cost of profit we got wasn't really people. It was really other things like wiping the yellow pages bill out and replacing it with something a lot cheaper. We, the, the profit came from a lot of places. Um, um, you know, if you can find your potential clients online and uh, then you can develop processes to, and you can develop process to sell to them. Um, um, and by the way, when you're doing this sort of stuff, you want to watch out for the difference between marketing to people who are already actively looking for your product, product and marketing to people who are not aware of your product. You must be very aware of that. You're going to get more if you can get the ladder going. And that sales funnel stuff, a lot of people sells is flawed because it's only targeting people who are already looking for you, which is probably a very small part of the market. Um, if they face a computer, then it can be done. And our numbers, I can tell you, I can share this with you. All up, our numbers, our, 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 all up, our, our wages bill was 78% lower than Australia. And we managed to achieve twice the productivity. So you just chop those into your numbers and see how it looks. It's just really phenomenally good. If you've tried at home people, it's very different. So the odd Odesk people or online person uh, is, 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 is very different. It's, it's different than what I'm talking about here. Building your own team is way, 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 way more productive. Um, now, by this stage, I'd started running tours and teaching people, or teaching Westerners, Americans, Australians, Kiwis, British, South Africans, um, all sorts of different, Russians actually, all sorts of different people um, about what to do and not do in the Philippines and, and which models work and which ones don't and why. And I was doing that by running tours, obviously not running them now because of COVID. But while I was running tours, I came across a, an Australian call centre that was doing outbound calls into Australia, collecting money for charities. And it was most of the big name charities. And when you walked in there, the Filipinos were all standing up. They weren't sitting down at a desk. They were standing at the high desk. They had cordless uh, headsets on and they were talking with their hands and explaining their sales pitch. Now, it's pretty evil stuff. You know, they're ringing and people are slamming the phone down and stuff like that, but they were making and collecting a lot of money. And I kept saying to my salespeople that my call center people, because we had an inbound call center and we were running on set scripts. And I kept saying, there's a better way of doing this. This I've never seen anything like what this other guy's doing. And they said, go and find out. And what I found out was that they don't use structured scripts. They use what we call dot point selling, or I call dot point selling. So the sales pitch is actually a series of dot points, maybe seven, points that while you're talking to the client, you cover the seven points and that's how you make your sale and close your sale, a different way of doing it. It's a harder way of doing it because you've got to teach the people a hell of a lot more about your, your product. But we decided to experiment with that. So we went to a place called Clark, which is two hours north of Manila. Um, probably the same as going to Newcastle from Sydney or maybe Toowoomba from Brisbane or something similar, Geelong from Melbourne. Um, the wages there are a bit lower. The loyalty of the staff was a lot, lot better. I had a friend there with some spare office space. So we did a little trial where we put a pilot test in. Now, the call center, we had two call centers for a while, one in Australia and one in the Philippines. And the Philippines one always outconverted the Australian one. So we ended up with three call centers. We had one Clark, one in Manila, and one in Australia. And we could see the crossover. And we found that dot point selling was a hell of a lot more efficient than the scripted selling. It was um, well, not a, a lot more, but it was more efficient than the same thing. They were getting higher conversion rates. So we started playing with Clark, which was out of Manila, out of the big city. 
And we found that Clark was a much, much better place to operate. It really was. Um, the wages were lower, the staff loyalty was higher, and the skill sets were as good. And we found that a lot of people go to the university up in Clark than go to Manila. It's a little bit like they do, you know, university in, in Newcastle and they go to Sydney, same, same thing. Um, and around this time, I also um, saw the opportunity in doing something better for the Western trade than what was already available. The serviced officers thing that we were doing originally was a really good idea, but I could see some flaws in it. So I managed to pull together a couple of business partners and we set up a company called Shaw 360. And it's kind of a, the same service that's there, but in a, in a newer, better way. Almost like many moves started 35 years ago, we entered the removal company, but we entered with a niche and we, and we changed how that niche is done a much better way and it just boomed and took off. And Shaw 360 has done the same. It's gone from, from um, zero uh, a few years ago to just on 900 today. Um, if you want to know the COVID numbers, um, entering COVID 12 months ago, we had 700. We dropped to 600 in a very, very short period. And then just like a lot of the businesses in Australia, we rebounded out the other end and have now shot up to about 900. So the COVID and squeezed margins and this whole shutdown things driving more of the stuff offshore than we have had before. With Shore 360, we basically married six factors together. We're using office space for tacit knowledge, similar to serviced offices. Um, we've got a, we use a payroll service with its own legal employment entity. So that saves you establishing full legal entity and we run the payroll, which we have to do because the laws and all that process, processes are very, very different in the Philippines. We pay proper pay conditions. So we've got health insurance, sick, sick and annual leave, et cetera. That's a huge, huge thing. The Philippines is a very modern, very regulated workplace. They've, they've got maternity leave, paternity leave, all the same stuff we've got here. They have a, a thing called DOLI, D -O -L, the Department of Labor and Employment, very strict, a lot of unfair dismissal cases, very similar to here in some ways. But it's a huge issue. And it's a huge issue when you're contracting people that are not getting the stuff. They're not telling you and they're leaving. And that's what, why they're leaving. They're not getting their, their proper entities and the stuff you need to, to, to settle into a long-term job. Um, we put it in a location away from the big issues. There's a lot of turnover and a lot of problems in Manila. Um, structural problems have been getting to work, a whole lot of issues. So Clark is much, much better. And we've got some other operations in other parts of the Philippines as well now. Uh, we developed much more to efficient marketing. It's a huge thing that we did. I, I could see the floor. They had to be, we had to have much, much better recruiting to get a better quality workers or workers, workers better suited to what you needed and no fixed term commitments. We wiped all that out. Um, you can ramp up and down at will. Um, you know, I learned from the, the GFC, we need to avoid the, the big fixed commitment thing. You need to, uh, you just need to avoid that. You need to be able to ramp up and down, go with the market and have a service that plays the game. And that's, that's the way it is. You don't need lock contracts. It's really crazy. Um, you can have them if you want them, but I don't think you need them. I can't see any reason for it. I think it hangs you if things go wrong. Our special source. Um, so the three of us that, that are shareholders in, in, in Shore 360 really know what we're doing. We've been at it for a long time. Uh, I think we give a we we know that we also we have the experience to guide and help you and get it right and that's really what we're good at um, and uh, just just a word about staff turnover by the way can I tell you that staff turnover really comes down to you um, I'm noticing that some clients have higher turnover and some low turnover it's all how you you treat the people and I'm really going to cover that in the next webinar next week I'm going to talk about people and and if you do the right thing if you do the people the right way you're going to have loyal staff to stay with you forever and that's going to really make a, a much better business for you um so like many members we ended polishing up the service um so office-based teams you own the people in their space in the space um, you're calling the shots um, twice as good with productivity 78 percent low in cost and we help you. We help you get it right, which is the key to how Shore 360 has got to where it is now. If you want to know more about any of these things, I'm more than happy to yak to you. You can get at me through LinkedIn. Half the time, you can pick me up just by putting my name in Google. But you'll find a way to contact me, uh, and I'm more than happy to chat. I'm semi-retired nowadays. I share a lot of this stuff, and um, with a lot of people, I don't expect any comeback from it or feedback from it. I just enjoy helping people. So with that, and on that subject.
we'll hand back to uh, to Agatha. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was wonderful, Mike. Thank you. Absolutely brilliant. Uh, blown away. I'll probably invite all the um, panelists, all the advisors now to uh, unmute yourselves, uh, turn on your video, and um, we're going to start our session. Um, hello, hello, hello. So, um, I'm going to go around the room. First of all, um, you know, make your intro. I think it's best for you to introduce yourselves, sort of, I guess, um, what you do and what you're offering through the ASBAS Advisory Services uh, Digital Solutions. Uh, we'll start with Dante. Go right ahead, Dante. Uh, Dante St. James, based out of Darwin. We're currently traveling in uh, far north Queensland at the moment. I work primarily with Facebook through their Community Boost program and as a community trainer and lead trainer globally for them. Um, I also work with Treaty Business Consulting out of the Northern Territory and doing a lot of work in North Queensland right now too. What I'm all about is basically taking businesses that are hesitant about the whole digital marketing thing and making it easy for them to approach it in a systematic way, whether that's through one-to-one -one consultation through the amazing ASBAS Digital Solutions Program, which is giving so many people the opportunity to do this, and through more um, ongoing online coaching, all that sort of thing. Um, what I really want to do is work with people who are looking to work, who are small businesses, small businesses that have been affected by COVID-19, those that haven't been able to rebound quite the way they'd like to, and like to know how they can use digital tools to be able to do that. Back to you. Fantastic. Thanks, Dante. All right, move over to Tracy. Trace, uh, take it away. Hey, folks. Tracy Sheen, known as The Digital Guide. I'm the author of The End of Technophobia, A Practical Guide to Digitizing Your Business. I've got 30 years experience in digital marketing and sales. I've been around so long that it wasn't even digital marketing when I kicked off. Uh, so I'm really looking to work with people who are maybe a little technophobic or perhaps they're not embracing the tools around technology that they really could to get their business really humming. So whether that's productivity, whether it's marketing, whether it's sales, whether it's getting a good CRM, whatever it is, let's have a chat, let's get you sorted, and then we can move you through to some of the experts that can really go deep into the specific areas that you need resources with. Back to you, Agatha. Thanks, Tracy. That's fantastic. As we know, of course, digital and technology, that's change and transformation. And uh, that's what we're talking about today. And we do need someone like you to actually, um, I guess, empower that change. Uh, let's go with Joshua. Hey, Josh. Hey, how are you doing? Good, good. Hi, so my name is Joshua Clifton. I'm the Director of Master Host Coaching, and I've been in the hospitality industry for about 20 years, working with and for a lot of hospitality businesses. And my goal now is to help businesses build their brand development and primarily learn how to communicate not only with their staff, with their core product, but also themselves through the whole process. So very much focused on helping you develop that core product, that core message, which is paramount and how to deliver that in a, in a very uh, precise way that gets you the results that you want. And um, I'm really excited to be on the ASPAS program. I'm already working with some amazing people and I'd love to sit down with uh, you and have a quick chat for free and um, see what I can do to help. I love it. That's fantastic. Thanks, Josh. And Nathan, take it away. Thanks, Agatha. And thanks, Mike, for another great session. Um, I'm Nathan, based out of Perth, Western Australia. Um, I've got a, a, a real passion for helping brands look good. I think we would all agree that the world of digital, the world of social media um, is a pretty crowded sort of sp place and space. Um, so I'm passionate about using branding, marketing and strategy to help your brand, your business, um, your company stand out from the crowd. Um, I've worked across the sectors of business, government and not-for-profit. I'm um, more than happy to sit down and have a chat about how myself and my team might be able to help you and your business. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks. Thanks, Nathan. That's great. So I'm going to share all the links of all these lovely advisors today. So any of you who would like to access um, the one hour free session with these advisors, please do book them in. 
Now, um, the first question we have here, and it's it's very relevant to staying ahead of competitors and change. Uh, Mike has shared, um, I guess, some of his turbulence through his uh, mini movers. I'll probably throw this to uh, all the advisors, and you know, we, we can start with yourself, Tracy. Um, what is your scariest moment, and uh, I guess uh, the most down to the wire sort of moment in building your business so far, um, and especially just staying ahead of um, your competitors? Wow. Um, okay, I think anyone in business has got a few war stories, right? So uh, I've had more ABNs and more business names than I would ever care to admit. Um, I think the the biggest thing, fail fast, fail forward and move on. So, um, you know, pick the lessons up, incorporate them and move on. Even last year when COVID hit, like really hit, um, I came back from my wedding. So we got married at the end of February. We were, were in Melbourne this time last year for the Grand Prix, sitting in a cafe with, you know, everyone waiting to go to the F1 and then finding out, of course, that it was cancelled because of COVID the day that it was meant to kick off. I came back to Toowoomba, which is where I'm based. And within two weeks of that happening, I lost every single client that I had, bar one. So I had a real kind of moment of just sitting there and licking my wounds and going, all right, well, you know, now what, how can I incorporate all the learnings and pick myself up and move back on? So I took the next few months to write the book, reposition a few things that I was doing, took it as an opportunity to jettison the stuff that I wasn't enjoying in the business that was probably weighing me down a bit and relaunched again. So We've all got war stories. Welcome, welcome to the club, I would say. Thank you, Tracy. It's such a, a great sharing and exactly that, you know, you just pick up and then fall forward. I love that. Um, all right, Nathan, how about yourself? Do you want to share, you know, your scariest moment of your business life? Uh, it's a great question. Um, I think there's probably multiple stories I could share, but I suppose, um, working with my, you know, the initial few clients that I had and sort of second guessing yourself, second guessing what you can offer, second guessing whether you could even help their business to move forward. So um, I suppose for me, it was a matter of getting some early runs on the board and, and sometimes even offering, um, you know, free consultations here and there or some free services just to give yourself a bit of confidence. Uh, but I've found it during the, the tough times in business, it, it really comes back to what sort of relationships have you built and are you building? Um, if you can build good relationships, then chances are you'll, you'll manage to sail through the, the rocky seas, um, but you'll also come out on the other side stronger. And as Mike said at, at the start of his session, word of mouth, having people that, that talk um, that talk up your business or, or that tell friends and family about your business, um, that's the, the best form of marketing. Um, you know, even with all the digital marketing, social media and everything else that you could spend thousands of dollars on, if you've got good relationships and people that talk well of your business, then you, chances are you're doing pretty well. Oh, I love it. Yeah, absolutely. Word of mouth. Um, Josh, uh, I'm sure you got a lot of those because being in the hospitality <laughs> industry is very tough and very competitive. What uh, do you yeah, think? How much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. Um, look, I think, uh, first of all, I just want to say thanks, Mike. I didn't say thank you before for that great talk. I really got some great takeaways, and especially the point around the job keeper, job seeker, especially in the hospitality industry, how it's still propping it up. And just to be so uh, putting the finer um, look into your finances and can you run without that support right now? And if not, you know, make some decisions. But scariest moment. So I... Um, I've been developing the idea of master host coaching for over 12 years. And that was basically nearly nine years of no income because I wanted to work on a concept, multiple ABMs, trying to figure out where it was, but I was committed to see it through. At the end of 2019, I finished writing my book. It was, um, I published it and 
I went around Australia and around the world and I'm so grateful. And I thought, you know what, it's time to, because uh, I was still working in the hospitality industry a, a bit there, helping out some friends and that kind of thing. It's like, you know what, I've got the book now. I'm going to go out on my own and start up Master Host Coaching. And that was at the end of April. And so you can imagine when COVID hit in March and the hospitality industry was hit so hard and everything shut, I had no clients of any kind. So I was kind of on my own, very concerned and a little worried. But it just came down to... Um, being able to pivot and adapt and try to come at it at a different way. I, rather than seeing who, where I can get business from, I seeing what else I could provide those clients. So it turned into a resource allocation, teaming up with other hospitality professionals. And now that the industry is back up on its feet, um, I'm now working with hospitality businesses and small businesses alike. So very nerve wracking, but um, the learning was so worth it. Thank you. That's fantastic. And Dante, I know, I know a lot of your worst stories, so you better be original this time. <laughs> How about you? Scariest moment? Uh, it was probably um, most recent scary moment would have been about three years ago where I had to make a decision between paying the car repayments for the car I had or paying payroll. Um, I chose to pay payroll at the time and continue to pay payroll for the next three months, at which point my car was repossessed. Um, I thought I was a really together guy in my 40s, knew what I was doing, knew I was running a business. And there was all this money that had to come. And the problem was, it was at that point of the year where people don't pay their bills. We call it the end of financial year. So people just in that May, June, they just hoard their cash and don't like to pay their bills and their invoices. So I came out of June having lost a car with no way to get it back because didn't have the cash to do it, was just barely scraping through to pay rent and pay my payroll. And then came to July and suddenly hundreds of thousands of dollars just started landing in my bank account. And I was like, you know what? I'm never going to allow that to happen ever again to the point where I, do, I have so little cash behind me that I have to either go scrambling for paying payroll from credit cards and paying payroll from all those sort of places. Um, just it was, a, it was a very humbling lesson that no matter how far you think you've got yourself together, when that cash flow dries up, you then start to realize you, all that bluster and all that bravado and all that bravery you're walking out into the world as a business owner is, when the cash flow dries up and people aren't paying their bills, it is terrifying when you've got 12 people who are relying upon you to pay their bills as well. 100%. Well, uh, did you find a, a money tree or something? How do you get the hundred thousands of dollars to land into your bank account? <laughs> Well, people just started paying their bills and they All weren't right. paying before the end of the financial year. So it went from having nothing to suddenly being, I'm fine. I'm good now. All right, that's good. <laughs> New car. <laughs> Fantastic. All right, I think this question quickly is uh, probably for Mike and is a very important question. Uh, what was the original reaction when uh, from Australian customers or Australian businesses talking to you about offshore operations? Uh, was there any backlash? And if yes, how did you handle this? And I know with the Go Local campaign that Australia is currently pushing, uh, what do you think we can overcome this? And, and you know, what's the benefit? I'll be honest with you, I don't think any campaign is going to change the uh, internationalization in this world, the connectivity and and thing is logical is saying we're going to start making car motor cars again in Australia. It's just never going to happen. Um, I A few months before I did it, there was no way known I would have ever put any of my customers' uh, phone calls anywhere near... Um, Sorry, the Filipinos, anywhere near my customers on the phone. When I first went to the Philippines, I was absolutely bent. I was only going to put administration up there. It was going to be very deep back office. You wouldn't know it was there. And as I said, uh, they were talking about scary moments. I took that phone call from the bank and the world changed. And, uh, um, so when, when I went up there, I was just going to do that. Uh, I, I got the bank screwed down on me. And, um, you know, you got your back to the wall. You're going to lose everything. The Dante thing, and just and you just lash out and you decide, bugger it, I've got to go forward. I'll just do it. So I just one day I said, look, I'm going to ring phone phone calls up. My manager said, no, you're not going to do that. Blah blah blah. I said, well, you saw the communication from the bank. Your solution is, he said, okay, we're going to move phone calls up. So, <laughs> and that's the reality. We need a solution. Um, there were a handful of customers, probably about one in a hundred, we estimated, that had a problem with it and voice the problem. However, they nearly all went on and booked, which was the interesting reality of the, the beast. Uh, 
from the first very first day that we put phone um, sales into the Philippines, the Filipinos outconverted the Australians. So from a financial perspective, there was no problem whatsoever. It was purely a brand perception problem. Um, we have never seen any evidence that the Filipinos is in any way actually costing us money. Um, it's interesting when we first started 10 years ago, there were comments. We don't get any comments at all now. Uh, if I talk to them now, they say, you know what, sir, we'd never get anybody asking. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a misconception, it really is. Um, Remembering these people were trained to be as good as Australians at their job. They didn't ask stupid questions or have funny words or mis didn't misunderstand you. We really pushed hard to train them to get around those things. So a lot of the things that people raise with me are issues, are issues that we sidestep by building our own team and training them in depth to do a really good job. And I can't help but stress that because a lot of failures in offshoring. And Absolutely. when I go and look at them and talk to them, it's all about how they've employed the people. It's all about how they've trained them. And a lot of it's got to do with expectations. I've got no idea why so many small businesses hire somebody overseas and suddenly think all their problems are going to go away and the overseas person are going to do it better than anybody else has ever done it. I have no idea why you do that, but I watched you do it over and over again. And it's just not right. Just not, not the same. I love it. I know it's like a magic wand. Um, yeah. Thank you. That's it is a wonderful answer, and and you're spot on. Absolutely spot on. Uh, it doesn't take the problems away just because you're offshore, um, and it's all about training them and get the ma uh, managed expectations right. Now, there's a question here from Sandra, and I do love it. Uh, when marketing your business digitally, uh, you do recommend invest. Do you recommend? investing in paid advertising and SEO. Um, I know several business owners who are very successful without spending any money on these. It's all organic through blogs and website traffic, etc., including word of mouth and traditional marketing brochures, um, um, etc. So um, I know most of you are um, digital marketing expert. Uh, what do you think about this, paying advertising and SEO? Probably start with Dante. Do everything you can for free before you start paying for anything. That's the simple way. If you can do your own SEO or at least learn how to do it, if you can write content, if you can shake hands, kiss babies, meet people in networking, join a BNI, whatever you can do that's not going to cost you money to do it, do that first. When that stops working, it probably means you're a nasty person, no one wants to talk to you. Or you just have exhausted your pot of gold and you need to move on to where the next pot of gold is. Do it for free first, then start paying. I love it. Very good answer. Tracy, what do you think? Uh, I'd recommend having a read of a couple of books. One called Content Inc. by Joe Paluzzi. He built his entire business around content. So you can absolutely build a gold mine out of creating good content aimed at your people and their specific problems. It's a long burn though, right? So just be aware that content marketing is a long burn. If you're looking for a short, sharp hit, then sure, maybe some Google ads or Facebook ads or something like that might get you across the line, but that tap is going to switch off as soon as you stop feeding the beast. So Content Marketing by Joe Paluzzi. The other one I'd recommend is Building a Story Brand by Donald Miller, and that's going to get really clear on your story, on the vision that you're trying to portray, and that's going to help build um, the foundation behind it. Thank you. That's great insight. Thank you. Uh, Nathan, what do you think about that? Yeah, I think the, the two big things for me, I guess, are is brand and content. So if your brand is good, if what you're offering is good, then people will talk about it. People will be attracted to it. KFC could spend all the money in the world on their marketing, but if their chicken isn't good, people aren't going to go near it. Um, and then your content. So if you're writing effective content for your website, for your social, social media posts, um, short, sharp to the point, expressive, authentic, revealing the, the best bits of, of you and your business, then chances are people are gonna be drawn to that and it hasn't cost you a cent. So brand and content, you get those things in place and it will save you a lot of money going forward. I love it, of course. And Josh, what do you think? First of all, it's, it's a great question and I, and I see it quite a lot in the hospitality industry. And I, and I guess the main thing is 
are you asking that question because you're not getting enough customers and you want more customers or you want, you're already growing and you want to expand further? I think that's the main point here is because businesses will work or, or they won't. And you can, it's all about investing time into testing the market with an idea, testing it, getting feedback. And if you get a good response, expand on that idea, get a bigger response and a bigger response. Digital marketing, any paid digital market should always be there to complement what you do, not necessarily to try and get more customers in. It'll get more attention, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to get more customers. And I think it's really important to understand your core strategy, your core business model, and ensure there is a high enough demand that it can be duplicated in that way. I love it. Thank you. And Mike, what do you think about that? What do you think about paid advertising? Um, we are all individuals and our businesses are all individuals and what works for some businesses is different for others so it's a bit of a generalized question when there are many many individual businesses out there a lot of what i talk about is about selling time selling a service and that's all about getting people to rave about you first paid advertising and most selling time and selling service the most effective paid advertising and i'll argue with anybody is, is sign writing <laughs> if you can sign write your vehicle a few hundred dollars and it just stays there for the next five years it's going to get your brand out there quicker than faster than anybody unpaid i completely agree with donna you do everything you can do for free you get just everything you can do you know i do public speaking i every time i did public speaking mini movers got more customers it was at the end of the day my public speaking was all about getting more customers in in mini movers and you know i've, I've sat down with marketing gurus and said that's how i get customers and they go cross-eyed they can't quite understand it's anything i'll just talk i'll go to the opening of an envelope if i can tell people the mini mover story and get more customers and nowadays of course you're 360 and things like that other businesses that i haven't talked about here so paid look individuals you've got to be a bit careful guys you're all individuals it's different solution for each one um uh I find lead gen works for mini movers more than uh, PPC or, or uh, pay, uh, pay per click or, or Facebook advertising, which is good. We use Facebook because it's good branding in the background. It really is needed. Um, but lead generation is finding out who your potential customers, contacting them and pitching it is fundamentally more efficient than trying to blast out there. Um, I like to split my targeting into two targets those that are already looking for us or looking for our type of service, therefore SEO, uh, and those that have never heard of us and don't even know we exist, so we've got to get into a different space, which uh, is all about a thing called Friends from Mini Movers. We have a whole campaign out there which got into the heads of people that could send cu customers to us, like real estate agents and self-storages and all those things. So it's all it's a mix of mix depending on how you're doing it. Absolutely, that's great. I do apologize. I'm mindful with time and I know um, there's, you know, probably a lot more questions from everyone. Uh, I have put through all the links for any of these advisors. My uh, suggestion is book one hour with one of these lovely advisors and actually get your strategy right. And if you haven't accessed the program before, it's going to be free. And of course, Mike, thank you very much for this. I think there's someone actually specifically asking a question for you. I have sent your contact details in LinkedIn so they can connect and ask you questions directly on LinkedIn. Now, uh, before we go, Mike, do you want to just give us one takeaway from this session about being a hit uh, on your, uh, from your competitors and change? Sure. But remember, next week, I'm going to be talking about how to get people rowing in the right direction. And it's really going to be quite different. It's going to be in all about people and the sort of things we did and the strategies and everything else. Final word from me. If you, I can't control a competition, but I can set the standards. I love it. That's fantastic. All right. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Dante. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you, Josh. And thank you, Nathan. I will see you next week and stay well. Cheers. Bye.